Well, in light of what we're just saying, we begin today with a question. What is it that you stand for? You really stand for it. What are those core values for which you would be willing to die if called upon? Would it be possible for someone to wave a big sum of money in front of your face and as a result of that, compromise your integrity? Would it be possible? At what point could you be bought? Or could you never be bought? How much temptation are you willing to endure for the cause of your marriage? How much temptation are you willing to endure for the cause of your God? Young men and young women, how much peer pressure can you withstand and not fall into worldliness? What do you stand for? I hope that everybody here would be able to say with absolute confidence that they are willing to stand for the highest principles and never be bought, never be pressured to change. Not only do we have to stand as individuals, but we also have to stand as a church. Jesus' churches have to stand for something. There's a principle that has been lost on the world today and unfortunately on many of God's people as well. And that is this, when you stand for something, you immediately also stand against something else. William Wilberforce lived in England and was born in the late 1700s. He lived until the early 1800s. He stood with the slaves against slavery. He stood for something. Despite a, a tremendously hard time, and having evil spoken against him by seemingly every side and amidst great opposition, it was his effort and his willingness to stand that eventually put an end to slavery in England and, and ultimately had a trickle-down effect all the way to the United States of America and Western civilization. When we stand for something, we automatically, by default, stand against some other things. And I said that many people in the world don't understand that. Many people will demonize that today in this era of tolerance of everything, even opposing views and opposing ideologies and opposing doctrines. And God's people in some ways have bought into that as well. There's nothing to be ashamed of in standing against some things. Churches need to stand. We stand for doctrine. Bible doctrine. We stand for justice. We stand against the current of our society and if we're standing on the principles of God's word, we become greatly countercultural in what we stand for and in what we stand against. And rightly so. Now, folks, we can do it graciously as God's people. We ought never to be ungracious in our stands. We should never be abrasive <laughs> and hateful, but we should stand Amen. firmly planted and unyielding on truth. Well, we started a series of messages on Sunday morning a few weeks ago in the book of 1 Thessalonians. We're going through it pretty fast. We're only spending one week in each chapter, and we're talking about what happens when God's presence shows up in a church. What kind of change comes about? What kind of transformation in a church and in a community? When God begins to do a great work in the lives of people, there is a transformation of heart. And there is a transformation of values as well. That happened at the church in Thessalonica. Things changed there because God's presence was there. It was visibly there. It was there in great power. Some people say that God's presence is everywhere and in every church. And that's true in a certain respect. He is omnipresent. But the manifestation of His presence has been so real at certain times and at certain places in history. The Apostle Paul was talking to the church um, because they were going through an intense time of persecution. If you remember the context when we led into this, we saw that Paul went to Thessalonica, encountered intense opposition, was only there for three weeks. There were a number of people that turned to the Lord in that time. But Paul was driven out of that city, he and his helpers. And so they left a fledgling church behind, but one that, had, uh, that was full of people who had been truly transformed. And Paul's um, passion and his heart and his zeal for them remained untouched. 
And so he, he's writing back to them. He, he tells them this when it comes to persecution. He says, we are appointed thereunto. Appointed unto persecution. Now, you may not have um, thought that you were getting into this when you accepted the Lord. But suffering is the Christian life, or suffering in the Christian life, is appointed by God. That's what Paul tells the Thessalonians. If in your workplace, your relationships, or in the public sphere, you're going through a difficult time because of your faith in Jesus Christ and your willingness to stand for Him, all of that is a part of the Christian life that ought to be expected, and it's part of the growing experience that all of us have if we are truly walking with God. If that's lacking, there may be something wrong when it comes to our willingness to stand. Well, Paul discovered that these church folks at Thessalonica, even though they were being marginalized, even though they were being ridiculed for their faith, and even though measures were proactively being taken against them to the point of imprisonment and execution, they stood. They stood. Unflinching, unyielding, Paul intensely expresses that for that, I am deeply, deeply grateful. The key verse in today's message is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 8. We're going to go through 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 here in just a moment. I'm going to read it and we're going to comment on a few points out of it. But 1 Thessalonians chapter 3 and verse 8 gives the key thought. And I want you to grasp this. I want it to sink in. I want you to see it. If you're in the habit of underlining in your Bible, if you're in the habit of highlighting or putting a huge star in your Bible next to certain verses that stand out, this is one that ought to stand out. This verse is amazing. And I can't say that I really remember seeing it before in the past very clearly. It's very brief, but it's the heart and soul of what I'm going to speak to you about today. Paul says this, 1 Thessalonians 3.8, he says, For now we live. If ye stand fast in the Lord. Paul is saying this to paraphrase. I was so worried having to leave you. Uh, knowing all the persecution. All the difficulty that you're going to go through. I was so worried I couldn't sleep. I couldn't function. Because I knew of all that turmoil that your church was going to go through. At last I can breathe again. I can breathe a sigh of relief. I can relax and be joyful. Because I've heard that you are standing Fast. That's what he tells them. Well, the term here is a military term. It means that you stand and you hold the line when arrows are flying at you. It means that you stand when it's difficult. It means that you stand when it's terrifying. You stand in good weather and you stand in bad weather. You stand when others stand with you. And you stand if others do not stand with you. Paul says, now I can live. Because I heard that you are standing fast. That shows you a little bit about what Paul saw as the purpose of life. What his purpose for living was. And what there should be as well. The Apostle Paul also mentions his worry and his fear that they might not have been able to stand. In verse 5 he says this. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I couldn't stand it anymore. I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter have tempted you and all of our labor be in vain. It's quite a warning, by the way. Paul says, I was so concerned about you because it is absolutely possible that the devil derailed you in your walk with God. Now, the devil does three things in regards to our faith, if you're a believer. First of all, he wants to prevent our faith. Well, I guess I should say whether you're a believer or unbeliever, right? So he wants to prevent our faith in the first place. The Bible says that he even blinds the minds of those who are trying to listen. Now, there are some of you who are listening today who may even hear the words that I'm speaking, but it's not going to have an opportunity to sink deeply into your heart. Why is that? There's a battle that's going on. We talked about it, if you missed if you're missing our, our Daniel studies, we've been expressing a lot about this and studying into it. But we talked about it some this morning. There is a battle that's raging behind the scenes. It is a spiritual battle. And it's one that wants to keep 
every person blinded to the truth of God's word. There's a battle that's going on even this morning for you to concentrate on what I am saying. Understand that. Jesus said that the tempter not only blinds the mind, but he sometimes snatches truth right out of people's hearts. It's what it says in the parable that Jesus told about the seed that's planted. And he was using an illustration of a farmer that would go out and broadcast seed. He would sow a field, a hay field, a barley field. And they would sow seed all over the place. And it lands on different types of soil. He says that the seed is the word of God. The soil, the types of soil are people's hearts. And there's some that are fertile and that are receptive. And they'll immediately receive the the seed, and they have the substance in themselves to allow that seed to grow and to become fruitful. And then there's some, some uh, types of ground where he talks about it's just hard and compacted. It's the road. Some of the seed falls on the road, and the birds come and they eat it. It has no opportunity to spring up and grow at all. And later on, he explains that the birds are the devil. And he snatches away the word of God right out of some people's minds. Some people here, and I can put myself in this boat at many times as well, some people will struggle to remember what it is that I even spoke about when you wake up tomorrow. Maybe before you even get home in your vehicle because of this battle that's going on. Why is it that we may not remember from one week to the next, what we study from God's Word. It's because it doesn't impact us deeply. It doesn't go beyond the surface. And so, what does the devil do? Well, I'm trying to, trying to set the stage here for you. Paul says, I'm thrilled, I thank God, because I've heard that you stand. I can live now. Uh, but, but he had expressed his worry before he sent a messenger to go and find out and get a report. He was worried lest... The, the tempter should have deceived them and pulled, their, uh, pulled the truth away from their hearts. And so what does the devil do? Well, he prevents our faith. He also snatches truth right out of people's hearts. And if the devil can't do that, then folks, he discourages us. Illnesses, friends that betray us, catastrophes of epic proportions, difficulties in our lives, persecutions, and I could go on and on, but those things can erode our faith because that's what the devil is after. Paul says this, I was really concerned that maybe the devil got his way. And it was going to turn out worst case scenario that you weren't following God. Because I knew the intense suffering that you were going to endure. <coughs> Paul was so glad that he finds out that he's wrong. Well, how does the Apostle Paul strengthen this church? That's what we're going to focus on today. How does he contribute to making them strong enough to weather the storm? That storm of persecution and difficulty that they were enduring. Well, it's the very same way in which you and I strengthen each other. When I send a child out of my home that I've raised to go work in this world, to attend school, to go to college, I want my child to have a backbone. I want my child to stand against the possibility of the debauchery that will be available to him or her. I want them to stand. So what is your contribution as a parent? What's your contribution to that as a child? How do we stand? Well, first of all, it's difficult to stand because the temptations to not stand come from within. They are the desires of the flesh. They are the desires of the mind. Secondly, there's also peer pressure. That is pressure from without to get us to compromise and not stand. I see it all the time. And I marvel at the incredible power that peers play in the thought processes and the behaviors of their other peers. Peers, uh, the, the, the influences that are seen in their lives. When I counsel with people who left the faith and left their homes... Almost always they will say this, I got in with the wrong crowd. Amen. It's the power of influence. So you have the struggle within to not stand. And you have the struggle or the pressures from without to collapse. 
The temptation is twofold. Many people fall away from the faith completely and they want nothing to do with it. And then many don't fall away completely, but they just live in vain because of the pressure. Now that's what Paul said he was worried about. I was worried lest the tempter should have deceived you. And all of our work would have been in vain. It would have been for nothing. Empty. How do we help people? I hope that you're ready because I'm going to give you Paul's strategy this morning in the remainder of my time. Now in the end, I guarantee you this, it will transform your life. It will transform the lives of your friends and the life of this church if we take it seriously. Because God's word has the power to do that. And I hope that you came this morning expecting that God was going to do something in your life and in your heart. Every one of us should come prepared for that, excited for that, and ready to see that happen. And so, and, and so let me just say, first of all, what's your expectation this morning? I hope that you're expecting that God is going to work in your heart to unearth some skeletons and to eliminate some things from your life and some desires. And that he's going to work in other people's lives as well. That ought to be the prayer on our hearts as we go into this study. So, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. I'll tell you that first of all, how did Paul encourage the church to stand there? He encouraged that church to stand by sending Timothy. Alright? He begins in verse 1 by saying this. Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we could no longer stand it, we <clears throat> thought it good to be left at Athens alone... And sent Timotheus, our brother, and minister of God, and our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ, to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. Now, now notice the contrast here. Paul understood the importance of having co-laborers with him. He understood the importance of the, the good influences that needed to be even in his life as, a, as an apostle. But he said it was more important for us to be left alone for a time so that this one Timothy that he loved so much could go back and be with them and do these different functions that he talks about. Paul couldn't go back there himself as we saw because there was criticism of him. Right? If you've been following this series of messages, you'll remember, uh, again, he was run out of town. He couldn't stay there. He couldn't go back. And he was also busy at Athens, as you can see in the book of Acts. And so he says, Timothy, I'm sending you to go find out how the church is doing. And I want you to establish them. Now, that's the concept of being able to stand, right? It is to get grounded, to get rooted, to get stable. So go back and establish them so that they are strengthened and able to stand. What is Timothy? Well, first of all, he's a brother. He's noted in that way, all right? We sent Timothy, our brother, and he's a fellow Christian. Paul said that he's a minister, which means a servant. doesn't mean somebody who is more important than the church. It means he's someone who's a servant to the church. He's a fellow laborer, which shows that you are really a team player. He was going to go there not to lord over the congregation, but to help this congregation, to disciple this congregation, to help establish them in maturity. Elsewhere, Paul calls Timothy frequently a servant. Diakonos is the Greek word that that comes from. That's the word, that, the Greek word that we get our English word deacon from. If you've heard of deacons being in churches or you've been in a church where there are deacons, a lot of times that's misconstrued and it's utilized in the wrong way today. What should deacons be in churches? Well, again, it translates into our English as servant. It's the same word that we get servant from. They may be, they, they may be people that do numerous things, but they certainly should be leaders who stand alongside of others and strengthen them. That's what Timothy was sent back to do. In fact, let me, let me just interject here and say that Timothy was so unusual and so young that Paul actually had to defend his youth. He really did. Paul says in Philippians, when he talked about his exceptional character and what an amazing help he was in the ministry, he says this in Philippians, For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own. That is universally. Everybody seeks their own benefit. And not the things which are Jesus Christ's. But ye know the proof of him. He's different. He stands elite 
head and shoulders above others. He was cut of a different cloth. And Paul says, I'm sending Timothy, this incredible servant, to help you, to help establish you. How do we stand, folks? Hear me. How does the young Christian soldier in the military who is surrounded by all these opportunities to waste his life morally and in other ways, how does he stand? The answer is with the help of others. Service members, students, trainees, those who are required to travel for work or other reasons when they go off to training or college or whatever, wherever they might go. The first thing that you do before you even go there is to find a church. Find a group of believers that are going to help you to stand. Find other Christians and join them and immerse yourself in Bible study and Christian accountability. Apart from that, I can predict with almost absolute certainty to you today that you will not stand. Because hear me, almost nobody stands alone. That's why we need one another. Dozens of times, dozens and dozens and dozens of times over, I can tell you of the lives that have either been lived in vain or have drifted totally away from the faith because of neglect of this principle. Amen. When it comes to the functions and the essence of our church here, how do we stand? We help one another. We serve together, folks. Um, Think, think about this. Uh, we, we had a Bible study here in our small group here a few weeks ago where we talked about the, the critical importance of church relationships and what we do. And you look at all the one another commands that are in the Bible. There, there are dozens and dozens and dozens of them that say as a church what we should do for one another. We serve together. We pray together. We witness together. We strengthen one another. We read God's word together. We fellowship together. We challenge one another. Friends, I'm telling you today, if you are standing, if you are a person who is already standing, stand alongside of someone else that you can help stand for the faith and be encouraged. Be a leader in this. That's what God asks of us. That's the first thing that Paul did is he said, I wanted to help establish you and make sure that you were standing for the Lord. I sent to you Timothy, a leader, one who was standing himself to stand beside you. Paul says that it's necessary that they have someone beside them. And secondly, Paul says that it's necessary that as you are standing together that you know something. He says this in verses 3 and 4. Yourselves know that we are appointed thereunto. For verily, when we were with you, we told you before that we should suffer or tribulation, even as it came to pass, and ye know. Alright, there's... Two times in that short um, little portion of scripture that I just read where it talks about some things that they know. They know. They're facts. All right? There's been teaching that's gone on before this. Even in those short three weeks that Paul was able to be at Thessalonica, he did an incredible amount of teaching with those folks. He says in verse 7 that he was comforted despite all of the distresses that he knew they were going through. He was comforted by their faith. Faith is confidence in the Word of God. That's what it is. It is an assurance in the Word of God, in, in the promises of God's Word. For the man that he sent to Thessalonica, Timothy, he also wrote the books of First and Second Timothy. Now, all the letters that Paul wrote are not necessarily part of inspired scripture, by the way. I'm sure Paul was a tremendous writer, and there were all kinds of writings that he sent around um, the world in his days to folks that he ministered to. Um, but First and Second Timothy are inspired. They are part of God's Word. And those were two letters that he sent to Timothy. What did he say in those two inspired letters to help ground that young man so that he could go and be an effective leader there in that community at Thessalonica as well? Here's what he was talking about. He was talking about those doctrines that are going to make people sound in the faith and able to stand. Read those letters. You'll see that as a theme. You can't stand without knowledge and understanding. Your ability to stand is not just in your own strength or power, but it's based on faith in the Word of God. In First and Second Timothy, 
He talks about God in chapter 1. God who founded his church. Then he talks about the return of Jesus Christ in the future. 33 verses of 1 Timothy are devoted to the return of Christ. That topic will also be one of my future messages in this particular series, by the way. In between those two powerful themes in Paul's writing to Timothy, who was the leader that he sent to Thessalonica, he speaks about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, who applies the Word of God to come alongside us and to encourage us, to energize us, and to help us to stand. We need the Holy Spirit today. We need the Holy Spirit on a daily basis in our lives, on a continual basis, um, to apply the Word of God. Because our sinful hearts and desires continually defile and tarnish the grace of God that's in our lives. It continually happens. The word of God needs to come, it needs to cleanse, it needs to polish the grace of God in our eyes so that we are enamored and enraptured by it again. At times, maybe you've left a service on a Sunday morning and you felt that you could just take on the world because God's worked in your heart. And he's brought some change and transformation in your life. And then on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday it wore off. And pretty soon you're back into the same old sinful and rotten patterns. It's because the grace that you receive today, it won't carry you through tomorrow. We need that to be renewed on a daily basis through exposure to the Word of God. Through the ministry of the Holy Spirit to apply the Word of God. The Bible is the, the, the spiritual food that nourishes us. It's the light that guides us. It, it's, it's the weapon that we have to defend us against assaults of the world. You need the Word of God if you're going to stand. It is absolutely essential. Friends, you represent God. And everybody around you knows that you represent God in this church. When you stay rooted in the Word of God... You stay away from those compromises that would make God and His church look bad in the eyes of the watching world. Amen. So how do we resist temptation? Well, we have to know who we are. And know who we belong to. Know who we represent. And then um, that knowledge or that understanding can only come to us through the Word of God. It's through the Word of God that we are strengthened to stand, even if we must stand alone. It's necessary to have someone beside you. It's necessary to have knowledge and understanding from God's Word so that you can stand on a daily basis and you can stand as a part of God's church. And third, which is incredibly important, Paul says this, I pray. Look now at the text in verse 9. He says this, now remember, the whole theme is centered around, around that one verse where Paul rejoices. In verse 8, he says, Now we live if you stand fast in the Lord. And so he, he says this in verse 9. For what thanks can we render to God again for you? For all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God night and day, praying exceedingly that we might see your face and that we might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Let's just go that far for a moment here. We'll read a few more verses. But, but notice in that wording, if you were reading along or if you were listening, notice the intensity of the prayer that Paul describes. Paul says, I pray exceedingly for you. Now that's a, a conviction to my heart right away. And I'll tell you folks, I love you all very much. And, and I'm burdened to pray for you. But it's a constant fight to make sure that my prayer life is what it ought to be so that I'm praying for this church the way that I ought to be. I was just going through some of that struggle this morning and spent some time in prayer for each one of you. But I still had an inward battle about whether to give my time to that or to give it to something else. Paul says, hey, I pray exceedingly for you. It's an intense prayer. Notice the frequency of the prayer. He says he prays night and day. That didn't mean that all that Paul did was pray necessarily. But the burden to pray was so heavy on his soul that even when he was working making tents, even when he was going visiting and establishing other churches, even when he was preaching 
And even when he was working with people, he was praying all the time for this church at Thessalonica. The burden was there to pray earnestly and intensely night and day. One of the things that God wants to do in our lives, to create uh, within us the ability to stand, is to inspire in us this kind of a passion for prayer. That's why I'm so thankful when I challenge or invite people to come and pray with me, that they do it. I'm thankful to see that. When God created in me a burden to pray when I was a young man, a teenager and several mentors of mine at the time were willing to sacrifice their time so that we could get on our knees several hours a week and pray together. Some people say, well, there just isn't time. I can't find time. Folks, you make the time for what's important. There is a passion that God wants to develop within us so that our will and His will are harmonized with each other. As we cry up to God with passion and with fervency, God says, hey, you've shown your seriousness and I will answer. Some of us have committed to pray for one hour a week all this year. As we studied through Jesus' challenge to his disciples to do that. Some are already struggling at this point in the process. The reason that you're struggling is because you don't want to say the same old things in the same old way. Uh, maybe there's other encroachments on your time. Uh, maybe maybe it's, it's difficult to even have anything to say um, for that long of a period of time. How do you pray? Well, you take biblical prayers and pray them. Take the Word of God. Take chapters of the Bible. Pray. Pray through those things and, and talk to the Lord about it. It's amazing how prayers arise out of chapters in the Bible that you might not think are specifically devoted to prayer. You notice how, uh, how Paul prays for these people. He doesn't pray like we do. Now get this. Almost always we pray. And I'm almost frustrated to say this, as you know. Almost always we pray for physical healing. Or traveling mercies. Or jobs. Or health. So and so has a difficulty, and so we pray, and we, we, certainly, so we certainly believe that we can pray to God for anything, to, to intervene, um, but we've tried to cultivate a more passionate and intense heart for prayer here at True North Baptist Church. To pray for the right things. And I hope that you're catching that spirit. Paul didn't concentrate on those things that I just mentioned. He was after bigger issues. He had bigger fish to fry in his prayer time. He was interested in praying, first of all, for their faith. Which he says in verse um, it's what he says in verse 10. He says, Night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now, it wasn't just a desire to go and see them physically and visit with them. But this was the reason for the visit. Perfect what's lacking in your faith. That's what's always at stake. Secondly, in verse 11, he says this. Now, God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. And the Lord make you to increase and abound in love toward one another and toward all men, even as we do toward you. That is essential if you're going to stand and if you're going to stand together. And it says in verse 13 to the end, or this is the goal of it, this is the purpose, that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God, even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ with all his saints. What do you pray for? You pray for faith, for confidence in the Word of God, both in your heart and in the hearts of other people. It is the most critical element. Nobody plunges into sin unless, first of all, their faith is cast aside. If you don't have faith in God and in His goodness, and if you don't believe God's way is best, you're going to go the wrong way. And so Paul says, I pray for the strengthening of their faith, and I pray for love to be evident between the brethren. If you have a hard, unloving heart, the Word of God cannot, it just can't penetrate it. It won't happen. I've seen people that have sat under the most passionate, 
preaching and teaching um, with, with God's Spirit evidently moving and working on others' hearts and they sit there stone-faced and absolutely cold and it seems like nothing can possibly penetrate. Well, if you have a heart and loving heart, God's Word can't penetrate it. He also says, I pray for holiness that you might be blameless when the Lord Jesus Christ comes. Do you ever wonder how to pray for your pastor and for other church leaders? Do you ever wonder how to pray for your fellow church members? Do you ever wonder how to pray for your children or for your parents? You pray as Paul prayed. God clearly answered Paul's prayer. Back to our theme in verse 8, he says this, For now we live. If you stand fast in the Lord. The bottom line is this. We need the empowering of God himself to enable people to stand. We need the empowering of God in the lives of our women to say no to lustful men. We need the empowering of God in the lives of our men to avoid seductive women and the temptations of sex and power that draw their affections away. We need the empowering of God upon our professionals to say no to compromise and to keep absolute integrity in their jobs. We need the empowering of God on our children and young adults to say no to the pressures of this culture that want to conform them to its mold instead of to God's. We need the empowering on all of our people to say, by God's grace and by God's strength and with his resources, we will stand. What can you take, take to the bank today from today's message? Why should you be changed by what you've heard today from God's word? Well, first of all, remember that in the Christian walk, every single inch is contested. There's always opposition. When Paul says... I feared that somehow the tempter had tempted you and our labor would be in vain. He was talking seriously about failure. He was talking seriously about somebody getting excited about Jesus and then going back into the world at some point in time. Even if their faith was genuine at the moment and they were Christians, he was talking about the joy that they would miss out on that they were supposed to have and the changed lives that, that they were supposed to have. And the loss of the opportunity to please God and to actually have some purpose in this short pleading life. You're saying that could be lost. They could miss out on all those things even though they had heard Paul preach. And even though they had responded to his message. Is there anybody here today? And you say, so far, my faith has been vain. My life has been empty. It just hasn't produced change. Well, it'll continue to be that way unless you return to the Lord. Secondly, what can you take to the bank here? What can you take home from this? Well, no Christian can stand alone. You can't and I can't. We weren't designed for that. Whether it's in companionship in the family where God said, it is not good for man to be alone. There, there is a need for companionship. Or whether it's in church relationships. That is a principle that God established for us. We can't stand alone. If we're going to be the church that God wants us to be. We cannot be this disconnected and disjointed concept that's so prevalent in our church circles today. We need to be impassioned and connected with godly love for one another. And full of eager um, uh, desire to disciple others and to be discipled ourselves. You can't live the Christian life alone. You can't do individually what God has called us together to do as a body. When it says in Ephesians chapter 6 that we should stand. And having done all to stand, it says take unto you the whole armor of God. Now is everybody familiar with that passage? Here's the armor of God. It's described there piece by piece. He lists all the different pieces of spiritual armor that we ought to have. And it says this. Above all. Taking the shield of faith. You know, even if you have the other pieces of armor without the shield of faith, your faith and your confidence in God is going to be seriously eroded 
so that you won't stand. That's why it says to take it above all. I've met countless people who claim to be Christians whose backbone is it's no stronger than a limp spaghetti noodle. That's what it is. I mean, they just can't stand for anything. There's no ability to stand. There's no desire to stand for anything. One of the reasons that Paul mentions the shield of faith, folks, when he tells us to stand is this. He's drawing a, an image for us of warfare in those days. You know, they fought in hand-to-hand -hand combat. They didn't have uh, howitzers and, and aircraft and uh, I, uh, ICBMs, you know, so they could fight from thousands of miles away. It was hand-to-hand -hand combat. In ancient times, the shields of an army were actually interlocked together so that as they marched into battle, it would be as if a huge wall was advancing against the enemy, offering protection for self, protection for your fellow soldiers, and it also offered unity of effort so that the whole army was working together. They were incomparably stronger than individual soldiers doing their own thing. Believers, you need one another. Amen. In fact, if you feel disconnected, and you're a member of a church, if you find yourself losing the luster or the spiritual fervor, if you notice yourself pulling back in service that you're involved with, consider what you can do to change that. One of our goals here has been in this church, as we've, as we've developed over the past couple of years, is to, to, to trim the fat, or I guess you could say maybe trim the leanness, depending on which way you look at it, but trim the fat of tradition and worthless ritual away from our church and provide genuine nurturing of the soul here. It's been our goal. It continues to be our goal. It's been one of the goals of our Sunday afternoon small group ministries. And I say Sunday afternoon tongue-in-cheek because the intent of those is not just to have an hour class on Sunday afternoons in place of service, but it's to give a time for church members to come together and be mentored by a leader and then continue that mentorship relationship all throughout the week. We're working on developing that further because the goal, um, the goal again, is, is not really what it's become here, where we just have an hour of Bible study together. But we want to connect people together in viable and exciting ministry opportunities and grow deeper in our spiritual relationships within this body. We need to stand together. Maybe I'm speaking to somebody today who may be looking in on Christianity from the other side, trying to make up your mind. Some may be believers, but they say, you know, I'm not standing. I've fallen. I know I've fallen. What do I do? Well, the good news is that the grace of God is able to lift you up again and help you to stand. The Bible says this, one of the most glorious statements in Scripture, that where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. Well, there are a couple of lies that the devil wants you to believe as we close up today. Lie number one is that sin just doesn't matter all that much. He tempts you and lures you to just do it once. It won't be that big of a deal. And then he comes back on the heels of that with lie number two. Well, now that you've sinned, there's no use in standing. You're a hypocrite. Might as well just give in completely. Maybe that's the way that you find your life right now. Have you, have, you, have you ever slipped and fallen in the mud before? I've done it on a number of different occasions. I remember a few times that, that uh, I was out on a four-wheeling trip and we were going through some mud bogs and um, I was helping push a four-wheeler out of some almost waist-deep mud and well, just through uh, maybe lack of sure-footedness or other dynamics, I ended up just face-planting, just being covered in mud from head to foot. And I can remember sometimes when that sort of thing happens that you almost, you get covered in all that slob, and you almost feel like just laying there instead of getting up and having to deal with it, right? You know, it's easier to keep on sinning than it is to repent. Amen. But to stand is much better. God's here today to help you. We're here to help you. We want you to stand so that we can say this. Now, we can live. Because you're standing fast for the Lord. There's a story that illustrates this. When Mount Vesuvius was erupting, there was a guard in Pompeii whose body was found and it was fossilized. 
He was standing fast at his post, unflinching with his weapon facing toward the mountain that was advancing on him. Wouldn't it be wonderful if every one of us could be like that guard, standing fast to the very end? The goal that should capture our hearts and drive us to our knees today is this. For now we live because True North Baptist Church stands fast in the Lord. Well, folks, I want to close. I want to ask you to stand, please. Bow your heads. This is your time to talk to the Lord.